So, hello everyone. Alex, thank you very much for the no amazing problem. introduction. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, good evening. My name is Jervos uh, Dimoglu, and thank you very much uh, for being here for my presentation of my research subject, which is Rebooting Interactive Films, an Intermedial Approach to Cinema and Video Games. This is my PhD subject as an external candidate at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And first of all, I would like to thank the WIG team behind this uh, amazing festival. We have been doing quite a lot of work and it's going very well so far. Uh, I would like also to thank my supervisors, Professor Jana Owen and Sidney Lannes uh, in Leiden University and Professor Jenna Ahn for her amazing support during the formative years of the research. And also Professor Elefteria Thanuli and Betika Klamanidou at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki who were my postgraduate and undergraduate professors and have supported me for many years in countless ways. So, this uh, subject is called Interactive Films as an Individual Genre, basically. So what I'm interested in is trying to define this genre which I situate between both cinema and video games. And it is placed in the wider context of media convergence. So I choose to focus on interactive films, which tend to combine filming elements along with gameplay to some degree. And usually they are presented to, through cinematic spaces, and you cannot enter these spaces, they are live action or they can be animated as well, but they have some interactivity and gameplay to varying degrees, and they do not allow access uh, to the space, they present the viewer with a number of options, through which you can change the direction of the narrative and affect the progression, basically, of the plot. So I believe that this kind of interactive film is situated in an intermedial and liminal space between the two media, and they are relevant today, once again, because of new viewing practices and the phenomenon of media convergence, mainly the fact that our television, our phones, our PCs, our home consoles, they can all do the same thing, we can watch films, you can play video games, you can call someone, you can access the internet, and you can all do this from the same device. And this allows for a new mediascape environment through which interactive films can be a viable genre once again. So basically, I believe also another important reason is the connection between cinema and video games. In the past, people would not perhaps think this would be possible, but today we know that there is a lot of exchange going on between these two media. So we have more classical films, right, like Ready Player One, being influenced by video game elements. We have Hardcore Henry, which is more like a first-person shooter film, where they, we never see the protagonist's face, it's always the camera itself. We have machinima films, which are, which are films basically uh, created by using footage from video games, but you cannot be interactive with them in any kind of way. And we have Ramlo Laram as well, which is another very interesting example because we see how we can create plots that can uh, be influenced by video games in a way. For example, Ramlo Laram has multiple rounds as the film goes on. I wouldn't spoil it, it's really good if you haven't seen it. Uh, but basically, yeah, there is an event, and we have multiple scenarios as the, we approach at the end of this event, and we see them in quick succession. So, I believe one of the main reasons behind the resurgence of interactive films is this relationship exactly. So now, basically, it is important to note that interactive films are not a product of this relationship of cinema and video games. Actually, they have quite a past and they exist before uh, video games become, became a thing. So actually, Michael Cowan, for example, places interactive films back to cinema's nativity years, going as far as back as 1901, where people had cinematic shooting galleries and they were able to shoot bullets at projected images on the screen as a form of early interactive cinema. And he actually mentions that more modern arcade games, such as Duck Hunt, which was really popular during the 80s, were influenced and hailed from these very early interactive films. One of the most uh, interesting examples of the 60s, because it, because it was very unique back then, it was Kino Automat. So it was a film that had a fixed beginning and a fixed ending, but it had multiple plots and it was presented in theaters in 1963, and the film would pause at specific moments, a presenter would come up on stage and ask the audience what would they like the protagonist, Mr. Novak, to do. So each viewer had a green button and a red button on their seats, 
and they could select, and basically the voting decided how the narrative would go on. And I think this, this showcase is a very important issue, uh, because if we want to show interactive films in a theater, um, the voting is an important part so that the narrative can progress, and some of the viewers might not see the outcome that they would like to see. And afterwards, uh, in the 80s and 90s, we had uh, full motion video games, more commonly called as FMVs. Back then, they were extremely popular because at the time, video games had really uh, low quality graphics because of the technological limitations. So people sometimes prefer to see cinematic uh, elements or animated elements as they play their video games. But at the same time, these FMVs had very low quality in terms of gameplay and very restricted gameplay options. So by the time graphics, computer graphics and CGI became really uh, to began to show their true capabilities, uh, these FMVs fall into obscurity and for example, Bernard Perron calls them a failed interlude of the 20th century. And most people thought perhaps this was the end for interactive films, but at the same time we have from the 2010s and onwards a re-emergence and a surge in popularity. So before we move on to that, I'll show a small case of So, in uh, more modern times, uh, we have, as we see, lots of interactive films. This was just like a screenshot I took very, very quickly from Netflix to showcase uh, how many we can find right now that we can play. There are also much more that can be found uh, in uh, festivals and more experimental uh, art galleries and so on. But these are also really interesting to me because these are more mainstream and this can be found in popular formats. And they are popular, I think, for an important reason. And that is that there is a convergence of media, and this is the culture that we live in perhaps right now. So Henry Jenkins uh, is the main uh, creator of this uh, theoretical concept, let's say. He defined it, it was already there. So basically, it is where media collide and they bring new media or new devices or devices that depend on specific media. For example, a very popular example is VR. So for a VR to work, you have to connect it to somewhere else and you have to present it media that have been created somewhere else. Another one is a phone, which back in uh, its uh, nativity years, it was just to call someone and then it went on that you can watch a film there, you can play a video game there, you can write notes for yourself and so on. So you have all these kinds of new devices uh, that can do all sorts of stuff. And this coexistence, cooperation, and intersection between different media systems gives us uh, new possibilities with what, with what we can do with narratives. So another important thing is that people now engage with media in their own homes, and there is increased interactivity and networking, and this means that there is a more active cultural participation. Someone may watch a film and then go on to internet and discuss it with lots of other people who are interested in the same field. And Again, the most important thing here is home entertainment because back in, let's say, the 60s or 50s, if you wanted to watch a film, your only option was to go to a theater and you could watch it with another audience. You could not watch it yourself at home. And you could not rewind, you could not pause, you could not see another film or you could not just leave or whatever. So you had to watch from beginning to end and that was it. And again, with video games, especially until the Late 80s, most people still engaged with video games in public spaces, with arcade games. The gameplay was really restricted, and you could only do specific things based on how, money you, how much money you put in the machine or what your skills are. However, nowadays, most people actually watch films and play video games in our homes. The beginning of this change started with TVs, with VCRs, and then went on with PCs. And I believe especially PCs were really the uh, breaking point where we have this breakthrough of new media because through a PC you can basically engage with uh, so many texts in so many ways. And there are both, there is a, both a diegetic way of interacting and a non-diegetic one. So for example, 
a non-diegetic example would be to just pause a film. This is not part of the narrative, but sometimes if an interactive film is what you're seeing, you actually, the film itself gives you the options to do something, and if you interact, then this becomes a diegetic part of interactivity. So this is why I believe that these films are important today, because we thought that most of them would not come back, but the, con the conditions that media convergence gave to us brought them back. So the most important terms here are intermediality, which basically means to combine different structural elements from different media into one single medium, in between us as well. This is important because many people thought that filmic elements and gameplay elements simply do not go together. Um, there, are, there is a lot of discussion, especially back in the 90s, between ludologists and narratologists who were kind of uh, find those two terms antithetical, but I think today we see lots of video games, for example, with narrative aspects, with very deep and rich artistic and narrative values. So I believe that they are found in an in-between space where it's actually that those differences are not antithetical, but they create something new together. At the same time, they are dependent on both media to form. Interactivity is again a term that can be defined through many ways and can be a little bit abstract as well. For example, let's say that you're reading a book. It still requires some trivial interactivity of turning the page to go on, and it can also include a figural interactivity in terms of your trying to think where the plot will go on or if there is any subtextual meaning to what I'm reading. But I'm more interested in figural interactivity and video games actually are found in the category of weak figural interactivity and interactive films as well. And this is why I think that we cannot simply regard them as films and go on with our lives. I think that it's important that they come closer to video games, but they are not strong interactive texts. Because strong interactivity requires you to influence the text in a way that the developers have not prepared it for. Let's say, for example, you had a book and you had words. If you could move the words wherever you wanted and create new sentences every time, this is strong interactivity. But video games do not have that most of the time. They have some rules that have been programmed and they are in place already, and you can play the game by the rules of the developers. So this is why interactive films and video games are found in the category of weak figural interactivity, while more conventional, traditional films are found in the weak uh, figural. So gameplay is also really important because many theorists also argue that interactive films have little to do with gameplay because we consider that gameplay requires some kind of specific skill that you have to develop, you have to progress to a level, get better at it, die and go on again at each time and sometimes you achieve it. However, there are many theorists as well who claim that what is more important here is dramatic agency. So what Janet Murray says is that if there is an action that is, that is anticipated by something in the story, and this anticipation re rewards you somehow through the progression of the plot, then we have agency. And Ryan as well says that if play is created in service of, ent of entertainment, then actually it is completely, if narrative, sorry, if narrative is uh, under entertainment, then it can be considered actually play. And she positions these kinds of text in an external exploratory category. And this basically means that if you can control just the narrative itself and you decide where you want to go on, but you cannot influence the in-narrative environment. In some video games, for example, you can take Minecraft, you can destroy and create stuff. In interactive films, you cannot do that. You can simply decide where you want the narrative to go. So some of the examples we're going to discuss today is Late Shift and Black Mirror Bandersnatch. This I find to be really interesting actually because we can see how these films can be in a liminal space and they can be both non-interactive and interactive depending on your own actions. We have Hidden Agenda, which is a really interesting example of including multiplayer gameplay aspects into interactive films. And we have Death Hunter as well, where we have screen graphics and the use of pause where interactivity actually becomes completely non-optional. So in the case of Late Shift and Lander Snatch, uh, in both of these films, as the narrative goes on, you are sometimes, uh, some of the options 
appear on the screen and you have a limited amount of time to choose one of them and progress uh, the narrative according to where you want to go. Usually it's just a couple of options, sometimes they might be a little more. But what is interesting is that it's a quick time event and this means that you have a limited amount of time to choose and if you do not choose, the film simply goes on and it can reach an ending by itself. You do not have to do anything, you can simply watch it as a film. And the very interesting thing is that Late Shift is a video game, let's say, because it was released on gaming, plat gaming platforms, but at the same time it was also pre uh, presented in film festivals. And Bandersnatch at the same time, even though it was uh, marketed as an interactive movie game experience, it won an award for best movie at the end. So we're not exactly sure if those films are films, video games, where we can present them. Apparently we can present them on, in film theaters, we can present them through video game consoles, and there is no problem. And it is interesting that the interactivity here is optional, it is an alternative option, it is not a prerequisite. And this means that once you interact with them, do they become interactive? Before that, they can be simply considered films. Hidden Agenda, again, uh, works in a similar mindset. It has two modes, a story mode, which is really close to what you described, and the competitive mode, which includes also uh, other players, and it can be multiplayer. So many people can connect with their own phones, and we can see uh, as they make choices, which mainly depend on voting, to progress the narrative along the path that they want to. What is interesting is that one of the players has a hidden agenda, which means that they have actually to play against the rest of the players, and the players have to find out who is the culprit, basically. So, mainly you interact with the game through your phone app, you connect it to your game device, and uh, this is when you decide when your character, for example, wants to shoot someone or not, and sometimes you have to interact quickly in order to not get yourself killed. Again, it's a quick time event. You might not want to do that, your character might die, and that's the end of the film. You do not have to interact with it at all. But the game still offers you the option to do so. So I have also a video here, but I skipped just to save a little bit of time. Uh, but I, you can have the presentation perhaps as well uh, through the web team, so if anyone is interested in the games, they can, you can search them, of course, yourself. And Death Come True, finally, is another important example that showcases the power that interactive films have over screen time and screen space. So here, the, the game actually freezes, like most video games do. They, it, it, it's not a quick time effect. So you have to make a choice, or this is going to be the screen that you see for the rest of your life. You have to make a choice out of things. It's going to stay there. If you like it very much, you might want to do it. Uh, and also, there are screens that appear on top of the screen, so you can decide on which narrative path you want to follow based on the information that the game gives you, not just by simple options. And here, we see that Unlike conventional films, we cannot measure the duration of the film. In most films, you know that the film is going to go around two hours. You might pause, you might rewind, but the part of the narrative is going to be two hours. But here, it can go as long as you want. It depends on the narrative part you choose. Some might be longer, some might be shorter. So, I believe that an important part is to understand how to approach interactive films. Basically, it's broken down into narrative, interactivity gameplay, and screen space at time. Boardwell helps us with a very simple uh, distinction between story and plot. A story is the whole lore, let's say, of the universe that we are in, while a plot is the, the way you tell that story. So there can be multiple plots, but the story is always one. In most films, story and plot are, tell, uh, are told exactly the same way. In most video games, this is not the case. We have multiple plots, but the story, the lore, still remains as one for this important. Brannigan helps us understand how we can have a narrative on both non-diegetic and extra-diegetic levels. In most films, the narrative is immersive in the sense that it's, it is given to you through the characters of the film. However, in most video games, the information can be given to you through a tutorial or through a book you find somewhere, and the same is interactive with interactive films as well. 
Interactivity in gameplay is important because they help us understand how interactive films come closer to video games and move a little bit more far away from films. Because, as we said, we have agency, and Ryan defines interactivity as something that still is play in an entertainment environment. And this is exactly what happens in interactive films, as the player can interact, the player can interact with them on the level of the screen. Finally, we have uh, hypermedia shift and uh, uh, order dura duration and frequency. These are terms that help us define screen space and time. In most conventional films, time uh, is uh, steady, while in most interactive films, the order of the events can change, the duration can change, and the frequency, the time of the repeated scenes, you can watch them as many times as you want. And hyperimmediacy is the fact that the screen itself becomes windowed. In more conventional classical cinema theory, we have the idea of André Bazin, who was telling us that the screen is just a window onto a world that we see behind the screen. But here, the screen itself makes itself noticeable as you interact with it. So, uh, to conclude, we can understand that, similar to video games and unlike conventional films, interactive films allow the viewer to explore multiple paths in an order formed by their own decisions. And this order can change with each viewing. Some plot lines might even remain unexplored. And time-wise, uh, elements such as pausing, repeated scenes, game over mechanics lead to non-linearity, expanded duration, and repeated frequency closer to video games than cinema. And based on that, I consider actually interactive films to be immersive. I find them in Ryan's category of temporal immersion of suspense and curiosity. Because Ryan explains that while the reader's curiosity in a suspenseful situation always concerns the story level of narrative, this curiosity is controlled by the author himself, and this is for themselves. This is why those who engage with interactive films may want to watch them again and again, so they can discover all possible routes and endings. And this is why I believe that interactive films can be both interactive and both immersive, and they can be perfectly considered to be part of this mediascape of a liminal space that includes cinematic and gameplay elements. Moreover, uh, Ryan analyzes interactivity at its five levels. I find interactive films to be on the second level of interactivity affecting the narrative discourse and the presentation of the story. In interactive films, there is no clear winning goal. There might be a best ending, but that depends on what you want to see. And the players, as we have said, cannot move characters or explore the narrative environment on their own. And in interactive films, such as Bandersnatch and Late Shift, options appear as written on the screen. The player can click on one of them to direct the narrative accordingly. In Death Come Through, they are, comp they are accompanied by images. And in Hidden Agenda, they can appear on your mobile app as well. So the goal, essentially, is to understand this intermediate genre of interactive films that exist between cinema and video games. They appear in both media, so they are dependent in, on both to form, but at the same time they are independent of them as they can appear in all situations. They focus mainly on the narrational and interactive aspects, so we want to reveal the mechanisms and the way they tell their stories. And we can say that in the grand scheme of things, this, can, this might be not so important, but if you're interested in cinema, if you're interested in the way uh, video games tell stories as well, then I believe this is well needed because so far we have not clearly defined interactive films. We do not clearly understand how they tell the stories and what is the methodological tools we can use to analyze those stories. So this is why I believe that this is important. The more we understand about stories, the more we understand about culture and the culture we live. That's it.